Welcome to this late session in the afternoon. Please, please sit down so that we can start the session. Uh, I believe some of our panelists have one or two have either left and one is busy, so we have a very comfortable panel. Uh, what we'll do is, like the last session was a good model, but we'll go two or three times uh, through the panel, okay, and discussing the various topics. Uh, I'd like to start off by just setting the stage on transport situation in India. Because if we are going to innovate in the future, when I won't be there, most probably, we are looking at a time scale when I won't be present. Uh, so all of you will be there. And all of you will be there. And so it's very, very important that you take it forward. All I can do is look at my old-fashioned ideas and tell you what's happening in transport in India. It's very important to understand the scenario. And after 20 years, if we grew, grow at a hecty space of 7% per year economic growth rate, then all models predict that we will have approximately 10 cars per 100 persons in the country. So after 20 years, that is in 1935, if we are very lucky in growth rates, we'll have 10 cars per 100 persons in India. Today, the US has 70. In 2035, we will have less cars per person in India than Mexico today because of our per capita income. Today our per capita income is $1,300, $1,400. After, if you are very lucky, after 20 years, we expect it to be five to $6,000 per capita. Thailand, Mexico, etc., are more than $6,000 today. So this, is, this will be the car ownership pattern after 20 years, which is 10 cars per 100 persons. Therefore, even after 20 years, for the country, the cars will not be a major form of transport after 20 years because of our income levels. There will be a reasonably major form of transport in some of our bigger cities. Today, except Delhi and Chandigarh, trips, work trips by cars in all Indian cities, including Bangalore, is less than 78% of all trips. So whatever we do with cars influences everyone in this room, but not most of the people in India. And I think that, that's the perspective we have to take. According to the automobile sector modeling and what we've done, in 2025-2030, the chances are that not more than 5% of car owners in India will be able to afford an autonomous car if the prices of instrumentation come down 10 times. 10 times. Therefore, 90% of car owners will not be able to afford the cheapest autonomous car in 2025 in India. So that's, that's the scenario. But I think it's very important we are having this conference. And it's very important so many of you are working on it because the kind of technology which this vehicle demands are so fascinating and so futuristic that they can be applied in this country in myriad of ways, not necessarily in the car. As was mentioned earlier, in tractors, in mines, in factories, in, in, in buses, in all kinds of stuff, but parts of that technology. And so it's, it's, I think it's imperative that we work on it and do better than everyone else so that we know the technology much better than the others to innovate with that technology and not copy it. I think that, 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 that's going to be the critical issue. The reason I know a little bit is because last year, 
I was invited to present the future of the autonomous car in India at a conference in New York and they selected me because they said I know nothing about it. So I had to spend one month learning something. And I gave my presentation in New York City in front of Google's and this and that and the Mercedes and all the other professors from Europe and the US. And I started and I'll do the same thing just now. And I said that, you know, I think my wife has some kind of automatic car because she talks to her cell phone and says, bring me four eggs. And half an, half an hour later, we have four eggs. She talks to her phone and says, please bring my friends from the railway station. And one hour later, her friend is at home from the railway station. She just talk, gives all the instructions to her mobile phone and it keeps happening. So we already have an autonomous car. And in India, the autonomous car is a car with a driver. So my wife doesn't have to drive. Whereas the autonomous car will not be able to go and buy four eggs. So unless the autonomous car's price is cheaper than the price of a driver, I don't need it in India. Because the driver is much better than the autonomous car. So let's move from that idea because we will need it for other things. The other couple of issues, please don't use any government numbers for anything except a few, except the census. Census is good. The total, we have done surveys in Rajkot, Delhi and Vizakapatna, uh, uh, so it's in three parts of the country. And according to our surveys, the total number of motorcycles and cars is about 50% of the official number. And the reason is all of you buy a car and pay your registration and you are finished. When you jump your car, you don't go to the RTO and return your RC. So all cars ever manufactured in India are still alive on the, on the records. So therefore, if you want to do any calculations, please divide the official number by two of motorcycles and cars. That's the official number. That's the real number. Number one. Number two, how many of you are from Mumbai here? What is the main mode of traveling to work in Mumbai? That's the problem. We don't look at numbers. Main mode of going to work in Mumbai is walking. Is by 45% of the workers. Train takes only 18%. Cars take 6%. How many go by bicycle to work in Mumbai? More than cars, 7%. You don't see them because you are in a car. So then before we decide serious business of technology and investments, we must know our country. Can an app take you to the correct hospital? Impossible. Because most hospitals won't admit you. The nearest hospital won't admit you if you are seriously injured. A private hospital will ask you to deposit 50,000 rupees for one night. Because ICU costs 40,000 rupees per, per, per night. So therefore you need human brains to decide where to go. Even if, for example in Delhi, the app will tell you go to the trauma center. And they only, if you go there, they'll say we are full. You go to Subdurjan next door. You go to Sabdajan, they'll say, Ashtok, Harek, Palanpe, three patient. Hai. <laughs> then you go to the third hospital. So the problem is not going to the nearest hospital. The problem is knowing which hospital to go to. Which an app can't do today. It may be in the future. And an ambulance, everyone talks about ambulances. If you take the actual cost of running ambulances, equipment cost, garage cost, three shifts, vehicle cost, etc., capital cost, minimum is 5,000 rupees per patient. Who is going to pay 5,000 rupees per patient? We can do it as demonstration systems because someone is subsidizing. And all the ambulance systems which have been implemented in India, guess who has been transported in it? 
50% of the patients transported are pregnant ladies who can go in a taxi or a car. So as soon as you establish an official ambulance system, it does not mean they'll transport accident people. Because whoever phones, you have to transport them. And so the richer the people, the more phones will come from them. So the poor people cannot work, most of the people who are hurt, and I'll st stop with one or two more things, but I want to set the stage for our discussion for our whole reality. In our cities, people inside cars are not getting killed in large numbers, only 2 to 4 percent. So if we want to help accident victims, we have to help pedestrians and motorcyclists. And cyclists, they are 80 percent. So anything which has to do with just inside the car is going to solve at best 5% of the problem for the nation. I want it because it will solve my problem because I'm always in a car. Okay. So I'm not saying it should be there. It should be there. But in the national scheme of things, we have to think of how to use these technologies in a different way so that others are helped. Uh, couple more statistics. Uh, everyone talks about sharing cars. We have not been able to do a scientific survey because very difficult, but anecdotal survey suggests more people are sharing cars in Indian cities than any app is doing in the West. Because when people get their first jobs in the junior people and companies and the government all share cars to go to work. All parents share cars who have cars to drop their children to school. So without an app, there's more car sharing in India. I will never share a car when I'm older because I don't want to smell other people. I don't care what app you get, I'm not going to put someone else in my car. I don't want to talk to anyone. When you someone is sitting in a car, they talk to you. So let's be real. Secondly, if people share cars in a society which is eight, 80 per 100 people, when they share cars, car use comes down, which is happening in Europe and US. In societies like ours, when you have Googles and so on, so not Google, sorry, Uber and so on, and you get these technologies, when it becomes very easy and taxis become cheaper and easy to use them, car use will increase because people who are using motorcycles and walking today will start using cars. So pollution and congestion will increase, it will not decrease in India. Bus use will decrease, more taxis will start getting used. No, so I'm not saying we should <coughs> But we have to start, it's a complex system. In all complex systems, you have to know your transfer function from input to output. The problem is we don't know the transfer function in detail for a lot of our And so I think all of us should join together and, and work on these technologies in innovative ways which the world doesn't know. And I think we're capable of doing it from what I've seen today. We just have to change direction a little bit. So now what we'll do is we'll go one by one. All of you know the background of our panelists, so I'm not going to repeat that. All you have to do is the first time when you speak, please mention your name so that they know who you are, though you're photographing. Okay? So what you'll start with is that what do you think I'll give you my book and I won't anymore. But what do you think is the role of the autonomous vehicle in India? Two or three minutes each, starting from you, sir. See, autonomous vehicle that is going to add to the problem. And already we are in a thick soup. And uh, unless, unless uh, it is managed properly, and uh, obviously we have to have some app. Because it is not only the people sitting in the car. We are coming across a pedestrian. We are coming across a motorcyclist. We are coming across a cyclist. Those who are moving on the road. 
So it is for the safety of everyone within the car, outside the car. That is one thing. But the main challenge, because the increasing population is leader, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention my name. I am Dr. Omkatash Kulkarni, mentor, technology provider, and a scientist. And uh, about my product, I would say solution to your problem is my product. <laughs> so, only one experience I will tell you. I had left from Daman in the morning 5 o'clock. I was to catch a flight at 10 o'clock from Bombay. I was at a distance of 1.6 kilometers from the airport and it took around uh, 35 minutes to travel 1.6 kilometer. And I missed the flight. It has happened in most of the cities with me. So how we are going to address this problem? <laughs> at least if you have to catch a flight. <laughs> so this is the challenge and uh, this problem is there, how you are going to address it. Whatever app you develop, whatever you do, how you are going to manage it with the Indian scenario. I specifically say Indian scenario. That is the challenge and uh, the floor has to think on this. Yes sir. Uh, what would you focus on very specific things from your experience and your background? On, what does this mean for us, this future? Hi, uh, good evening to everyone. My name is Sirish Bachu. I'm from Mahindra and Mahindra. I head the Infotronics and Advanced Electronics uh, uh, for the categories of Mahindra. So, uh, coming to the topic of uh, autonomous vehicles and all these new technologies and so on, I think uh, first and foremost we should assess what is the objective of bringing in this technology for us. Of course, there is there is an aspiration, there is uh, let us say a social compulsion that you have to compete and all those kind of a stuff. But uh, if, if you look at the Google, uh, why an autonomous car is brought, it's basically to change the game. And predominantly, if you heard the panelists in the morning, the focus in those uh, markets is coming from the safety aspect of it. How to make driving more safer? Okay. So that is one of the major driving factors why this technology of autonomous cars. Uh, is being looked into and more and more connectivity in the car to give more information for making more intelligent decisions. So this is the whole focus. Now in the Indian context where like what you said our socio-economic and demographic diversity is so vast, what is the objective for us to bring in uh, such an advanced technology, number one. Second thing is what are we trying to solve? Are we trying to just adopt technology for a certain purpose or are we trying to really solve the problem, for example, if we are talking about traffic congestion or if we are talking about some other social problem uh, 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 which need to be solved by applicating the technology. Are we looking at that? So I think this context needs to be very, very clear when we are looking at adopting of these technologies. Uh, in my opinion, the need for an autonomous vehicle, I would not limit it to a car. I would broaden it to an autonomous vehicle per se because other than the cars on the road which are of course uh, there are enough uh, people around to drive the car for you who can do much uh, in much lesser cost than uh, what you pay for the autonomous technology. But there's so many other applications uh, say for example in the farming area where today a uh, farmer uh, is really uh, uh, struggling to get manpower to do the farming to plow the land. So if we are able to bring an autonomous vehicle in the farm, put into the farm and help the farmer get more productivity out of it without depending on the people. Or say for example in the mining area where it is very very dangerous for people to go inside. If we can deploy autonomous vehicles and those things which go and get the material out of the mines here. And there are so many other applications. Say for example if, if you uh, now you have transportation itself. Uh, there is personal and public transportation. Now, uh, in the public transportation, can we automate many of the things where we know it's a predictable route? There is no uh, unpredictability in that, say, it starts from point A to point B. Can this be made much more safer by automating this entire route with an autonomous vehicle, which goes in a predicted manner, it has a time uh, efficiency with that, and it, it's basically making the whole travel much more safer and then encouraging more and more people to use it. I think these are the factors we have to look at before applicating this. And uh, with this angle is where we have to also look at what kind of innovation we are trying to bring in. Because uh, ultimate pinnacle perhaps in the personal segment or the uh, private vehicles, an autonomous car is like uh, uh, the holy grail to have. Yeah? 
but uh, how many people can realistically afford it based on the technology, cost of technology which is available and how many people would really want to have it even if the technology is affordable because end of the day you are buying your car with some certain purpose uh, unlike in the developed nations where the ratio is 80 to 100, uh, 80 out of 100 even if we go further ahead in future another 10-15 years we will only hit 10 out of 100 so that is the figures what you have quoted already and why is that? That is because car today is still seen as a status symbol, as something aspirational need. So even if you have your transportation needs filled, uh, fulfilled, even if you have an excellent public transportation, I am sure people sitting here, people outside will have that aspiration that I need to own a car. Even if it's sitting in a garage, I need to own a car. I will maybe use it on the weekends or something like that. On the weekdays, I use the public transportation, provided the public, public transportation is so efficient. I think these are the factors which will come in and at the end of the day, if that's a car sitting in my garage, if I'm taking it on a weekend, do I want to drive it or do I want it to uh, drive by itself? I think these will be differentiating factors in terms of how we see the application of all this and uh, this will define how uh, either we do the cost innovation or the technology innovation and these aspects uh, of our innovation. Thank you very much. I think uh, a very, very important issue has come up which is that maybe some of these technologies would be really useful in what is called public transport. The only thing I would like to point out is that in India, do not look at the official numbers for public transport because the official numbers for public transport only include official bus services. I know approximately in Pune, there are as many private buses running as official Pune public buses. The question uh, or no Indian expert use, includes those vehicles as public transport. So if you include those vehicles as public transport in Agra and Ludhiana and so on, then more people use public transport than any city in America. And more people use public transport in every city of India than any city of Europe. In Greater New York, 44% of the trips are made by car, in spite of a huge formal transport system. There is no city in India where more than 12% people use a car. So, if what you are saying can be done, it would be fantastic. Because, and then we should think of public transport in all these ways. Because your three year leaves every five minutes. I no need an app. The app cannot give me an accurate departure more than five minutes, two minutes plus minus. So you don't need apps, you don't need nothing. You don't need any prediction. They leave every five minutes. If you transfer them to buses, then they'll leave every 20 minutes and people will stop using public transport. So you have to optimize public transport using what you just mentioned, sir these technologies so that smaller vehicles can be used which are not polluting, maybe electric vehicles and other vehicles. And if they run frequently, we can reduce costs of, of smart cars, this, that, the other, because you don't need anything. You just walk to the stop and within five minutes you get one and you know where it's going. So now, so having said that, I've set the stage for our for the doctor from Bangalore. And could you straight away jump and tell us something about the study you have done on, on transport use? Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, I'm Radhika. Uh, very recently uh, at uh, Ericsson Consumer Lab, uh, we have conducted a study on co modality. That's, uh, st uh, you know, studying. Uh, uh, passengers uh, of public transport system in uh, London, New York, Shanghai, and in South Korea. We uh, conducted uh, uh, qualitative research in uh, four countries and uh, quantitative research uh, focusing on three cities in uh, Brazil, basically. So uh, we really uh, felt, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, happy to uh, introduce the see the commodality uh, as such, you know. Uh, the optimal utilization of uh, the private and the uh, you know the personal vehicles as well as the public uh, public transport system will be an answer for the future uh, challenges in the uh, connected vehicle sector. Uh, 
the very reason being, uh, if you ask uh, somebody who is owning a car or a bike or a, uh, you know uh, vehicles, personal vehicles, to give up your personal vehicle uh, for the pleasure of uh, uh, you know going through the public transport, uh, everybody may not do that. The best way uh, is to you know create uh, you know the opportunity of uh, parking uh, with a connected facility wherein you can uh, drive your vehicle, uh, ride your bike to a certain mile, it's the first or the last mile of your transport and park your vehicle and then continue your rest of the journey using a public transport, maybe a tram, train, bus or a metro, right? So that makes the optimum utilization of uh, you know the, all the resources available. So this is what uh, we try to understand what are the challenges that the consumers or basically the commuters face uh, in commuting to their work. Basically, it was very interesting uh, uh, experience for me because uh, I personally traveled, uh, you know, I spent more than 200 plus hours of my time traveling uh, in accompanied journeys. We made accompanied journeys with the passengers in uh, major, in all these uh, major cities uh, uh, and uh, trying to understand what are the main pain points uh, while commuting from their home to office, office to home, uh, office to, you know, then home to school and so on and so forth. Uh, we really uh, uh, we figured out uh, in the qualitative research uh, that London, uh, you know, the ma ba mainly the uh, Sao Paulo commuters uh, uh, spend more than 2.1 hours of their valuable time commuting to their work one way, followed by the Londoners who spend nearly 1.7 hours on just on the road in the gridlocks. You know, 1.5 hours of New Yorkers is spent just on the road commuting to work. So th these were the numbers, uh, you know, which uh, really made us to understand like how, uh, you know, uh, w what should be the uh, way in which uh, the, uh, the transport industry has to evolve or transform itself, not just to transfer the commuters from point A to point B, rather create a value for the commuter's time. <coughs> Because we spend time uh, just uh, you know uh, in the, in the on the road, just uh, uh, you know uh, cursing the traffic on the road or you know uh, uh, creeping the time and couldn't be uh, you know without getting connected to or do work because of when once you are commuting or once you are traveling your connectivity drops. That's what we have observed, right? Uh, so uh, with this, uh, what mainly we uh, figured out uh, is that. Uh, uh, commuters uh, feel that uh, um, you know the technology among the public transport industry, you know, and they consider the public transport industries as lagging behind in providing what exactly they are expecting. That means commuters are becoming far, far ahead in using the technology in terms of the apps what uh, what are available to them. They are making use of these apps to make their commute more convenient and easy and uh, and so that they can sort out many activities uh, that they can perform it on the way. So, I, yeah, I think we should start kick off from here and from a couple of things you said then we go through the panel then we come back to you. Sure. That's it. One of the important issues she's mentioned is how much time they are spending and what they need while they travel. There's quite a bit of work done for the last 30, 40 years, mainly in the West, on understanding these patterns. And what we understand generally now is that no one saves time unless their travel is forced. So everyone has a travel budget. Some people have a travel budget of half an hour. Some people have a people who don't like their husband and wife have a travel budget of two hours. <laughs> uh, people who live in poorer countries a majority of people have horrible homes. They're very small. So going back and listening to their children and spouse is horrible. So the, the, so the idea that people don't want to be outside the house appears to be wrong. It appears that a lot of people want to be out of the house for a certain amount of time. But they want to be in the house for a minimum of certain amount of time, which may be six, seven, eight hours, <coughs> 10 hours, 20 hours. Oh, sorry, sleeping plus six, seven hours. So what seems to be very interesting is that no rich people don't save time. Time is too cheap for them because they have too much money. 
For poor people, time is very important. Because with more time, they make more money. The rich people waste a lot of time. Because, because money has no value. And so, what we are discovering from the US to Western Europe is that if you give faster modes of transport, people start living further away. And so for the so they may travel in a more efficient train compared to the car, but then they buy a bigger house far away. And so the total amount of energy spent by the family increases. <laughs> so giving faster urban transport increases pollution and everything else. So there has to be some, we don't know the real, we don't know the, what is the, 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 the real nice point that what should, but it appears that door to door speed for cities should be somewhere around 20 kilometers an hour, or 50, which is the metro. So if you take, you cannot spend, suppose you just go two stops in a metro, you spend 25 minutes. So that comes to seven kilometers an hour. Now the metro becomes efficient only after six kilometers because you spend 20, more than 20 minutes walking in the station and outside. So that's one. And the number two thing we have found is that people don't use public transport unless car speed is less than 15 kilometers an hour. So if you don't have congestion, people will not use public transport. Second thing which Europeans are finding is if you have parking and off reserve parking in your office, you will not use public transport. So if you want people to use public transport or walk or cycle, please don't give parking in your office. And so these are the external factors which decide transport use. And that's why I think I'm going to ask you now, say that if this is true, if what I've just said is true, then all these technologies become even more important to make the experience of traveling a little more efficient, less painful, and more predictable. So what I want to ask you is that, since you have informatics expertise, is it possible for the smartphone to become the whole technology for managing the vehicle and your time? That means you don't need embedded systems there. Well, uh, that's a classic question which keeps coming from everybody, that whether a smartphone can take over the entire vehicle functionality. See, uh, the thing is, what do you expect of your vehicle? Do you expect it to keep stopping or just keep getting stuck at every point of time? Or uh, when you're buying a vehicle versus a smartphone, your expectations are completely different as a end customer. Because uh, even though now the price points, if you look at a smartphone, which is say, uh, the good ones which you get, uh, people spend, don't mind spending around easily 40, 50,000 on a smartphone. Yeah? Uh, the same thing, uh, 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 an entry level vehicle which is 200 lakhs. So uh, the price differential is six times of this. Now, when you're paying so much, uh, customer expectation on a smartphone is that uh, it is a disposable asset. You don't buy with a lifetime ownership for a smartphone. You know that this technology is going to change, this model is going to change. I am paying for the flamboyance of it, and I am paying for flashing the stuff or whatever the satisfaction you get out of owning the latest and greatest on it. But when you are buying a car, it is completely different. Basically you want, you are buying a car for a longer period of time. Earlier it was when in the initial stages, Indian customer, it was car for life. Okay, now it is moving now, the car turnaround cycles is anywhere between three to five years. People now sell it and go for a new car. So that is a minimum expectation period which is there. And you want to make sure that for that much amount of period, the car does not give you any trouble, it is reliable and it is completely trouble free and it is completely safe for you. So this is the thing. Now the question is uh, exactly for what you ask, whether the smartphone is going to provide this amount of reliability or security. I do not think so because it's a two different worlds and two different domains altogether. We still need to make the cars equally safer and have to have a lot of internal electronics, internal intelligence built into the car, which will take care of the uh, end customer need who is paying for that, as versus uh, giving a smartphone, letting a smartphone take over the entire stuff.
perhaps yes in certain aspects where as long as it is non safety critical as long as it is only secondary uh, information so for example now in the morning uh, there was a discussion on info infotainment and then some information coming from the cloud uh, to the uh, car dashboard or some traffic information flowing from there these kind of applications are absolutely fine i think that is where it is also moving that smartphones are more and more finding place in the car dash and so on but when it comes to a safety critical decision say for example if a brake is applied and there's electronic decision to be taken in how many milliseconds this brake has to react and the brake shoes has to be applied on the uh, brake drum this is not something a smartphone can do and this is this needs a dedicated stuff same way if you are talking of now further going for autonomous technologies inside the car to make it more convenient and then uh, I, I take your point that yeah, people perhaps don't mind spending that amount of commute time. Uh, given a choice, uh, uh, if it is more efficient, they'll spend longer distances, but the time spent might be around the same. So, in such a case, do we rely on a smartphone kind of environment, which is prone to uh, say uh, stopping or uh, uh, prone to kind of uh, uh, blockages and such kind of a thing? versus uh, the intelligence uh, residing in the car which is much more reliable much more proven and proven to be fail safe for you so this is the distinction which will come in and uh, as far as i see i clearly see divide in two different domains in the uh, automotive side itself one i will call it a safety critical which will need a dedicated solutions inbuilt robust approved over a period of time in fact uh, even the aps technology what you're seeing it's a result of last 25 years of constant iteration and constant uh, bug fixing in the software side or the function side which has now come to the stage that yes it can now be dependent upon but the same can't be said of a smartphone because today there is android there is a uh, apple uh, uh, ecosystem tomorrow you don't know what is going to be next and who is going to guarantee that so we'll always see a divide in terms of safety critical versus non safety critical and that is where these uh, smartphones are going to be applied yeah, I, I, I guess there are two things which you just talked about. One is, which is integral to the car, which cannot, certainly all your braking systems, etc., and the alcohol detection system will have to be integral to the car. But actually, I was thinking along another safety, the two main safety issues are that our experience of the last 50 years is the maximum safety benefits in the world where accidents have reduced have come from speed control. And, and, and alcohol control. And speed control earlier came by physical methods, now it's coming by cameras and so on in the West. To such an extent that France had, when the President of France found out that France had a much worse record than UK, UK has one of the best records in the world of four deaths per 100,000 people, US is 12. So if you migrate from UK to the US, your chance of dying in a car goes up three times. So. Uh, the President of France instructed the whole country that the death rate must come down. So there were only two things they did. No technology. Technology was used for alcohol detection, physical, plus speed control. And they have brought down their death rate by 50% in 10 years. So based on that experience, I thought that since we can't have that much police presence because of our in budgets and so on, suppose smartphones recorded, no matter which car you were driving, recorded your speeds and so on. And a policeman, wherever he stopped you, or your employer, could just Bluetooth your smartphone and for the last two hours see whether you exceeded the speed limit. And so that in itself, would, well, is that possible technically? Just could you get that? Technically, yes, very much possible. I don't, uh, there are also solutions available which will give you this information. The question is, what is the enfor enforcement mechanism for this? And that is where it will come to, in terms of then, is there a regulatory environment which is mandating this? Today, absolute, there's a, there, there is a, no clear regulation on the use of mobile phones itself, which is a big cause of distraction. And perhaps if you look at the accident statistics, uh, in, inside the city especially, th this could be one of the major causes. Actually, no, I, this is a hotly debated issue. Yeah. The Michelin by Bento had an international committee on connected vehicles and we met in China a few months ago. And so everyone in the world and every OEM was there, except Indians. And all the others were there, Japanese, Chinese, Americans, Europeans. And it turns out that the latest data from the, uh, 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 what's it called, uh, Naturalistic Driving Study of the University of Virginia, Virginia Tech, where they 
a few thousand, thousand miles of driving. And so they have a camera, as you can see when people are using a cell phone. They have found that cell phone use has not increased deaths. It's very, it's hotly debated right now. And the theoretical understanding is that people are sort of uh, optimized distraction. So instead of talking to the passenger, they're talking to the cell phone. Or instead of fiddling with the stereo, they're talking. So the distraction, there are too many things in the car that distract you. And so the cell phone distraction just substitutes some other distractions. But this has not been confirmed yet. Uh, at the same time, I think, what, why don't the manufacturer, all of you, all of you here who are dealing with this, if you have pressure that there should be a regulation that this, but these particular apps are compulsory on everyone's phone who's driving, and the policeman has rights to access that app through Bluetooth without getting any other information. If this is possible, that will make your safety issue very important. I think that that is very much feasible. I don't think there is anything stopping today to measure your speed or breath, uh, uh, breath analysis. That's more complicated. More, more complicated. But generally, getting the statistics of the vehicle and then passing it on uh, yes. to the regulatory authority. I think unless it comes as a regulation, people will not be motivated to take it. I'm just making an appeal, all of you who are working so hard. Do you think we can dug up together and make an appeal? Because that's how things happen in societies. The government does, does not on its own do it. We'll come back to you at the end, sir, when we finish. No, uh, the government on its own doesn't do it. No one does it on its own. Governments have to be pressured in every society. And so I think this group, since all of you are geniuses in this business, I think we should pressure the government because this will leapfrog your, 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 your enforcement system through an innovative use of technology. Exactly. And I really see the embedded system of the car I like for the, for the autonomous car because the embedded autonomous car is very rule abiding. So if a pedestrian comes in front, it will stop. So we'll, all of us pedestrians in India will have great time. We can stop any car we feel like. We just have to come in front of the car, it won't move. So any motorcycle can come and it won't move, so it will become very nice for pedestrians and bicyclists. The cars will be stopped completely. And all the pedestrians and bicyclists could move them. Because the embedded part of the safe car will not let it move if there's a pedestrian in front. So unless we come up with clever software which bullies the pedestrian like we do. So I think they, they, so that 100% that safety issue will have to be looked at. I think let's move to him and then we'll come back to you. you. Sir, you wanted to add? Uh, no doubt the uh, smartphone can be uh, substituted uh, for the embedded system. But rather than that, say again our dependency on the government policy and the government mechanism which is having a big question mark in our country. The embedded system in the vehicle itself can have such a feature when you are entering into uh, urban area or uh, high density traffic area, automatically, so I think it is possible that the car will be limited uh, to a certain speed, that you cannot drive at a uh, faster speed. I think that feature can be incorporated in the vehicle itself, but automatically, Whatever best you try to do, you cannot drive at a higher speed. So it can be an embedded feature. So in such case, it will be more effective rather than depending on government policy or government mechanism. Actually, it will cost much. I understand your your concerns, but I do not I do not have any evidence from any country in the world where the government is not very important, which is successful. Only useless countries have low government involvement. And one more thing. Just to give you a statistic. Yeah. At present, today, when it's the lowest employment by government in America, which is the most capitalist country, the total number of percentage of employees employed by some form of government, local or central, is 17%. And Europe is generally more than 24%. Have some workers have something to do with the government. In India, it is 3%. So we have one, the public sector in India is one, one sixth of the US. That's why India doesn't work. 
And so, so I'm not saying that the government should run hotels and airlines, but the hotels, but the government should run the police department. It should run the passport department. It should run the environment department, the highway department, and so on. So we are running out of time. What I'll do is, we'll go through you again once. Two minutes, two minutes, two minutes. Please, sir. See, another thing we have to classify the various zones. We are talking about the only urban area, dense traffic and all that. Say highways, expressways, they have got different problems, different challenges. Suddenly some folk of animals coming on the road, suddenly some villager with his tractor coming on the road. All these uh, problems are to be addressed with a different solution. Then in urban area, it is something different. So it is to be classified and the solution is to be worked out based on the local conditions or the uh, problems which is posed. So this is what I feel and again you know, it is not the statistics how many people are employed in the government and all that. It is their psychology and it is their efficiency and dedication commitment to their duty. That is what matters in our country. Thank you. Radhika? Uh, first of all, uh, Anything you'd like to say to any people here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nothing I have, uh, uh, you know, it's basically I am just focusing from the consumer's perspective because that's my area of expertise and uh, especially from when we studied the public uh, transport, uh, uh, you know, public transport users uh, and uh, we figured out that, uh, you know, uh, people are really not happy with, the, you know, nearly 56% of the uh, commuters are dissatisfied with the, uh, the video streamings and uh, they are really not happy with the communication uh, ability that they have at, uh, at present. And what they are expecting from the future connected vehicles or the connected transport system is an uninterrupted uh, connectivity while they are commuting is one thing. They are looking for some real-time information uh, on the crowd management uh, in, in, in the case of uh, public transport uh, services, wherein people can have, you know uh, find out if, if a metro comes in front of them. Which uh, uh, category is uh, which car is uh, literally free? Like you know, it's a 40 percent occupied, 70 percent occupied. Where I can go and stand, so that you know you can optimize uh, and you have a better chance of getting a seat in the uh, in, in those metros. In, in a similar way, like uh, people are also looking at uh, uh, having a unified ticket payment options. They are expecting uh, in, from the future, uh, future public transport uh, service uh, providers and. Uh, yeah, this is uh, basically to summarize what uh, what are the expectations from the commuters. Thank you very much. Sirish, so, can you give them a really optimistic view of the future technologies? Uh, well, see, coming back to the topic what we're talking about, uh, bringing in regulations like what you said, I don't agree to you that uh, everything can be black and white. Everything cannot be black and white. Okay. You cannot say you buy a car, but your car uh, even though it is possible of running 140 kilometers or 200 kilometers per hour, it, by government regulation, it is uh, allowed only to run at the 80 and not beyond that. No consumer will be welcome in that. You have to identify areas where this is critical. And like, for example, there is a school zone or there is a residential zone. Yes, you are bringing technologies. I think in the morning, I think Scott mentioned about this. There are tagging which is possible on a specific, specific sector of road. As soon as you're entering that, using a connected solution, using information available from the cloud, you regulate the moment about the speed in that zone, and then let it uh, uh, let the owner take over after that, after that zone is over. So I think there should be fine balance in terms of how you bring in this kind of regulation. <laughs> so uh, specific zones, and we need to identify that. Uh, second part of it is also uh, uh, if you look back in the transportation industry today. Tolls is such a big problem today. Okay, tolls everywhere is there, and there is so much of pileup which is there. And I'm, I'm sure uh, this was one of the IITs which came out with a report saying that at, at every toll there is so much of fuel loss, which is a, if that is curved, that itself will amount to around six to seven percent of the total imports what we are taking. That's the kind of wastage what is coming in. 
there is RFID technology which was mandated uh, as a part of the vehicle identification. But what is info enforcement? So there is absolutely no way that this toll collection is enabled through a, existing technology which is very much mature, which is very much there, but then where is the will shown to enforce this or implement this? So this is one of the challenges what I see. So unless the government makes up saying that yes, we see a value in this technology, we bring in regulations to enforce this technology and even if you say your mobile phone gives uh, the information about speed and driving back to that thing, who will act on it and what kind of action will be taken? So unless that is put in place, I don't think it will be successful. So this has to be from coming from one direction. The other direction is also all of us who are owning vehicles and who are a part of the society, we also should carry a certain civic sense, a certain discipline which is very much required. The same person who is going uh, say to the Singapore or US and then uh, uh, Europe, he will go religiously and then if he has to drop a garbage, he will go to the dustbin, try to search a dustbin if it is not there and put the garbage in there. But when you come back, the same person owning a Mercedes here will roll down the windows and throw, it on the, uh, throw the garbage on the road. And you expect the Modi to Swachh Bharat to come and clean for you. This is the kind of uh, mentality what we carry, unless this gets corrected. So it's a two-way street. I mean, government has to put in regulations, but people have to come forward saying that, yes, I'll abide by the regulations, I'll make sure that I'm not, it is not for me alone, it is for all of us together. And then when we say after traffic, traffic congestion is caused by each one of us. Each one of us is impatient. We want to go first. We don't give others the right to go first. If we allow at a junction saying that we stop it, let the others go, the life will be so smoother. Everybody thinks like that, it will be more like a pelea, pelea. That's a, a, a common saying in the... <laughs> I think now we should say pelea to the audience. And so three questions. Only three because I am under great pressure. And the last session always has to be cut short because the previous sessions are not cut short. <laughs> so, I will just take three. Yes sir, in the corner, behind the camera. Your, I, please identify yourself and a question. Hi everyone, and, uh, I'm Adarsh Kapoor. I'm an urban designer. And uh, I'm fascinated with the kind of discussion which is happening over here. But I'm equally disappointed with the number of planners and designers sitting over here. Because this is an area where planners and designers would have added some amount of merit and... Uh, question, sir? So, the question is very simple. Uh, we've been talking about automated cars. And in the automated cars, the biggest issue is that the roads are congested. Roads are congested because Driving behavior is not good. Driving behavior is not good because road geometries are. No, so it's basically What's the so it's basically a vicious cycle. And now no one is looking into how to solve this vicious cycle. So is there a mechanism where any of these apps or any of the systems are looking into affecting travel behavior or travel demand so that a limited number of people stick to private vehicles, a limited number of people move to public transport, and that balance is maintained so as to bring in the automated cars. Otherwise, automated cars is just a utopian concept for India. Thank you. I think since the main technical person here is Sanish, you answer that very quickly. I don't think this is a technology solution which is required for this. This is more of uh, uh, disciplinary stuff in terms of uh, what the personal preferences everybody is carrying. Whether you want to go in a car, that means you are adding to the traffic. Or whether you want to take the public transportation. Of course, there is other side of the coin where public transportation is not so efficient, which suits your preferences and so on. So, I think it's a, it's a kind of a, a mutual dependent uh, situation here. We bring in an autonomous car, a technology will be there, it can be put on the roads, it can be made so much robust, but then with the kind of heterogeneous mix, like what you said, uh, uh, so much of safety built into the autonomous car that uh, a pedestrian comes and stands in front of it, it will keep stopping, it won't move at all. So, it's, it's a very tricky proposition I would see. It's not a technology solution, is what I would yes, say. Sir, uh, we are talking about... No, first identify yourself so I can punish you later. Okay. <laughs> Sir, I am Shankar Shabastar. I am the managing editor for Automotive Products. Question now. Uh, question is very simple. That can we have some fixed land-based sensors and devices which can communicate with smart cars and integrate this problem of, you know, various... Uh, uh, geologies or congestion conditions or urban or rural conditions which will then dictate the car and on the car the sensor is mandatory that okay in this area you can speed up 120 kilometers per hour and this area you can only speed up 225 kilometers per hour. Can this technology be integrated like that? This is very much possible. I don't see any problem in this. 
In fact, uh, uh, today there are navigation systems which give you this kind of recommendations only that they don't no, enforce it. Sir, so I am talking about not uh, recommendation. I am actually talking about a mandatory device to be installed in all automobiles, whether they are trucks, buses, whatever it may be, including two wheelers. And a land based land based device dictates I guess the speed limit. Answer is yes. Technically it's possible and slowly it will come after your and my time. Sir last question sir, sir one sir I'm sorry one small point. Can the media in any way help in promoting this concept with the government? We have very large extent. Thank you. Last question. Gen no, sir, you, you can take few more questions. We won't cut short your session. <laughs> okay. Three more questions. Yes, gentlemen at the back. Hi, I'm Chandresh Bihani from Next Technologies. So, what I'm trying to say down here is, ki, are we complicating the nature of connected transport by creating individual ecosystems wherein each and every app that they are trying to build down here is not connected to each other? Isn't it necessary if we create, create a platform which is, let's say, led by the government wherein these developers, young developers can create localized solution which can run the, you know, on that platform wherein, let's say, each and every car is connected to everything and that is led by the government and then you have a platform where everyone can utilize that platform in order to you know create a localized solution wouldn't that be a better option than having an individual you know app or let's say uh, something you know put on into your car we have looked at that in our center and we have looked at the experience in the us especially for something like that it may be desirable it may be technically possible but for the whole fleet and the system around it to adopt it, the replacement period is about 18 years. And so it'll happen in your lifetime when you work, become a boss of your company. But it, 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 for, for it to happen, every single vehicle has to have that system in different ways. And so it's just a question of time. Yeah, but why? You know, I, I think we'll have to take, since we're going through. Is there any other question? Otherwise, you can carry on. I, I'd just like to add to that. I think it's an excellent suggestion, but we need to see to what degree this kind of a standardization is happening. If it is, say, for example, traffic information as a service, it is made available by some entity which is common, has common preferences, then you can, everybody can create their own apps based on information available and utilize this and deliver that thing, other than, uh, rather than individual ways of capturing this traffic data and things like but that. But there, you see, I'll just like to point out Whenever technologies are introduced, there is behavior adaptation. And that's a very, very important concept in technical innovation. So when a new technology comes, people change behavior and in ways you didn't expect. For example, last week I was driving in Europe and my navigator told me to go through a certain area, neighborhood. When I turned, there was a flower pot, in the, big flower pot in the middle of the road. I went to another road, that also had a flower pot in the middle of the road. So what the neighborhood had done was that because of the navigation system, people found out you can go through that neighborhood to avoid to, as a shortcut. So in that neighborhood, people were putting these, what you call flower pots, big flower pots, plants, in the middle of the neighborhood lanes at night, so cars going through didn't make noise. So your te technology had been disrupted by local people at night. So we had to come back to the main road and find another navigation route. And so that's just a very small example. Uh, for, for example, for ABS systems, when they first put in the car, the reduction of accidents with automatic braking was 30% of what we predicted as engineers. Because when people, the dangerous drivers, not the ordinary drivers, the dangerous drivers knew that the car won't skip. So they started driving faster. And so this is what we call behavior modification. So we have to do what we do as technical people, but don't underestimate the intelligence of millions of people on how they will react to what happens. Thank you. Anyone else? Can I ask another thing, like in just in order to continue this thing, if you've got some time? Actually, she's very tight. Oh, she <laughs> so, 
if there, if there's no other questions, I'd like to thank all of you. Uh, Professor, just one one uh, comment from my side. Is uh, we have been talking a lot on the technology side, automotive side, public side, and so on. But I think there's one very important piece of the puzzle, which is the telecom operator, the service of the telecom, because that is the backbone of all this connectivity. And that has been, I would say, either by design or by conspicuously missing in this entire discussion, which also needs a very tight performance related uh, association with it, in terms of because otherwise your entire system will collapse. There's nothing which you call a connected transport or a connected car or connected. There's nothing which can happen, and uh, this is a big challenge. Uh, availability of M2M platforms in India, or giving that kind of a quality of service because everybody is used to uh, adjust the way our voice calls are going on. But if we can't expect the same when we bring in a connected car with that kind of information, or uh, if you want to implement an emergency call in a vehicle, this quality of performance has to be assured. I think I would, uh, uh, this I've been urging in all the forums where I participate uh, to include also the telecom providers to get a feel of what we're talking here and what is their view on how they can bring in and complement this whole stuff. So that's, you know, that's a terribly important point to make. But unfortunately, what's happened is that because of what is public perceptions and government policy, we did something very stupid, which is auction. And because we thought the previous government had done something very stupid, and all the numbers were wrong, the number of losses were exaggerated, and our air rates were auctioned, which is a very stupid thing to do, and so all the telecom companies are bankrupt. They have no money because it pays too much for the air rates. And because all the companies are bankrupt, they are not giving you the service. So it will take a long time for our telecom companies to come back to speed. Because all of them are negative. And this is because with public pressure and public pressures on wrong information, we adopted a policy with public support to auction the air rates. And so, what you want has to be corrected. And once you do something wrong, it takes five, six, seven, eight years to correct it in large systems. So with that negative note, uh, I guess we must talk because uh, she's been standing there for a long time and I hope she's not too tired. So thank you all very much. You've been very patient. And have a good day.